right now. Hopefully we won't get a bunch of thunder on the recording. But it'll be fine. And then tomorrow, when I see people that I make small talk with, they'll be like, oh, it rained last night. Yeah, we really needed it. Because that's what you say every <laughs> time it rains. It's so true. We really needed yeah, it. Yeah, we really needed it. I don't want to talk about the weather. Ever? Usually not, unless it's like impacting things. Right. Like, like if I'm just out in the rain and I'm like, oh, it's raining. We all know. Yeah. I don't want to talk about the weather or how you got to somewhere. <laughs> like if you're saying, oh, well, I was going to take 149, but it was blocked off. I don't care. You didn't. I don't care. You didn't care about my trip to work this morning and <laughs> what buses I took. Eh, you got there. I got there. Knowing the exact route does not change your story. No, so I got I there and I got home. So, That's what you need. Ta-da. You did it. Yep. And now we can move on. So first. No. I... <laughs> <laughs> we are going to start our podcast. And what's our podcast called? I love this. You should too. Oh, I like that. I like, I'm going to throw it to you forever. That sounds good. My name is Indy Randawa. And that was my lovely co-host, Samantha Randawa. And she's posing, still not realizing 220 some episodes <laughs> in that we can't see her. Just imagine me being really cute. She was being really cute. Okay. And we know you have your choice of things to listen to to prevent you from ever being left alone with your own thoughts. And we're <laughs> glad you chose us today. So what are we doing today, Sam? Uh, today is one of our shorter episodes. And it is my week to pick a movie for next week. And we also have two spoiler-free things of the week. Fortnite. Yeah, yeah, we do this every two weeks. Yeah, and... But episodes every week. I'm going to wait to reveal what the theme for the next couple movies are and uh, until I reveal the movie, I think. All right. Well, until then, let's talk about our things of the fortnight. And these ones don't have to be themed, right? Because nope. I didn't prepare anything. N no, me neither. <laughs> awesome. So what's your thing, Sam? My thing of the week is the Netflix TV series Emily in Paris. Oh, what is this? I've heard you talk about it, mm -hmm. but I don't think I've ever seen any of it. Uh, so it is about a girl named Emily Cooper, who is a Chicago marketing executive and is hired to provide um, an American perspective at a marketing firm in Paris. And it's kind of a mixture of romantic comedy and drama, um, as well as just like escapism because the show is shot beautifully they make paris look absolutely beautiful um emily and her friends wear some of the most incredible clothing i've ever seen and um it's just a really good show to get like lost in is it a show where you watch it and you're like i wish i was doing that this looks lovely yes so there's a lot of kind of wish fulfillment going on yeah what is the show about like what's the tone it must be pretty light if it's, that's what they're going for it's very light um there's some like romantic hijinks she meets um some very good girlfriends who um they go on little adventures together and because she's in marketing um she gets to do some pretty incredible things including going to champagne in france um going to italy she gets to go uh to the south of france so you kind of get to travel along so it's kind of like a trip to france all packaged up with the drama and the comedy. So is the show itself good outside of that? Because you're really selling me on how it's going to look great and you can see all these different places and kind of as a travel show. But <laughs> how about the actual story and plot and acting about, of it? Yes, I really like the story and the plot. I don't want to give too much away. There's three seasons, um, so they've covered quite a bit of plot over those three seasons, but um, Lily Collins experiences uh, dating, you get um, relationship problems that people in their 20s have, um, you get to see her attempt to assimilate into a Paris marketing firm and some of her quirky coworkers, um, and you get to kind of go along as she feels a bit like a fish out of water and gets to kind of learn that America isn't like the center of the world. 
As much as they'd have you believe them. Yeah. Does she get to date any hunky Frenchmen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think every time you said Emily in Paris, I was thinking of a very different show, which I don't think actually exists. Or maybe I was just creating a live version of Madeline. I oh, thought it was like a, a young girl. school girl who <laughs> goes on adventures in Paris. No, she's a 20-something American from Chicago. So uh, check out Emily in Paris if you are looking for a little romantic comedy drama escapism. And Netflix, if you haven't already done so, I think a live TV show of Madeline. I think so. I'd watch that. I'd totally that. seems watch more that. fun to me. Yeah. Do you think... I would like Emily in Paris, or would I be like, eh, it's just much more rich people doing rich people things? Yeah, I think that's what you'd think. <laughs> okay. I'm glad that we <laughs> we know that, though. But my mom and I watched it last year. Um, she hadn't seen any of it, and we watched it while we were on a girl's trip, and it was like the perfect thing to watch for us. It was, it was great. So I just don't think it's going to be your thing. So next time you're having a glass of wine with your best bud, Watch some Emily in Paris? Yeah. All right. So, Indy, what's your thing of the fortnight? Well, I think uh, keeping in not this week's theme, but just the theme of our podcast, it's uh, it's appropriately uh, disparate from yours. <laughs> so my thing of the week are the collected works of author John Steinbeck. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, as soon as you said it was going to be opposite, I was, I was like, oh, it's going to be like dark, depressing books, isn't no, it? No, but it is definitely not uh, yay rich people books. Okay. So uh, if you don't know, John Steinbeck was born in 1902 and died in 1968. He was an American writer, a novelist, but other things as well. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1962. He wrote 33 books, uh, 16 novels, some nonfiction, collections of short stories, and I just read them all. Oh. So I haven't read every one of his non-fiction ones. I gave some of those a pass because I didn't want to... I don't like that nearly as much. I read half of his non-fiction and then all of his fiction. And he is a, uh, a socialist, and that comes up a lot in his works. And that was kind of the stuff I knew about him before I did my big deep dive. I knew Grapes of Wrath, The Mice and Men, kind of the big ones that I read in university. But I didn't know how good his other stuff was. Hmm. So, of course, I like that kind of stuff because I'm me. But when <laughs> he gets away from those themes, there's still a similar um, like pathos through everything, but what's, it's not nearly as direct. That stuff was all brilliant as well. And he um, got harassed by the FBI a lot hmm. because J. Edgar Hoover is a piece of shit. <laughs> they would just kind of pick on anyone that they thought was a communist. So right. that was him. So I'm not going to go over everything he wrote because that would be a, a long time. Mm -hmm. And I did that with Vonnegut, but I did it over three episodes. So it was a little bit easier. Right. So I'm just going to talk briefly about a few select ones. Some of my favorites or some that were kind of the standouts in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So first, let's talk The Pastures of Heaven. This is from 1932, and it's a collection of short stories, but it kind of is a novel almost as well, because each chapter is a new story with new people in it, but they're all taking place at the same time, mm -hmm. more or less, and in the same town, more or less. The first few chapters are kind of like a prologue, and it's almost the history of the founding of this town, and they cover hundreds of years. And I didn't think that they were linked other than the location, but then each story kind of was involving a younger person who is essentially being ruined by institutions in one way or another. Oh. And it had these child characters in a bunch of them, but they were all so different. But what they had in common was what they excelled at was not what society demanded of them. And they're kind of crushed into a mold in one way or another. And it's almost about celebrating kids for what kids are good at and realizing that people learn in different ways and have different values to society. And it's doing all of these things that I learn about in my uh, university education, education, when I was learning about being a teacher, all of those educational practices are being talked about now. But he's talking about this in the 1930s. So that was pretty awesome. And it's bookend by these intergenerational stories. And they show not the only the change in this particular community over time, but how society as a whole has changed over the 
the epic time of this book of short stories and how expectations one generation puts upon these the other that follows it are changing over time and how that changes the actual land and the community and probably American society altogether. Hmm. So that's The Pastures of Heaven, 1932. I thought it was pretty awesome. And it's one of his really early ones, but it seems thematically a little very similar to some of his late work, I thought. Oh, so how old would he have been when he wrote that? That one was when he was 30. Oh, wow. Okay. Next, there was this one called In a Dubious Battle, which is not, I think, all that well known, but I thought it was fantastic. It's this powerful novel that delves into the themes of social injustice, labor of movements, and just the human struggle for dignity and equality. So he took a lot of real-life inspiration from agricultural strikes that were going on in California at the time, because he's a guy who's writing through the Great Depression and living through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. He was living on a farm and uh, things weren't great, so he, he wrote about that. So this one shines a light on exploitation of laborers by powerful landowners and corruption that is throughout the system. And it's kind of like a historical document because it's talking about things happening right then. But it's also like so, so applicable now, which is kind of painful when you're like, huh, we're like... A hundred years later, same no shit's better. still going on. Yeah. And of course, because he's Steinbeck, all of those themes extrapolate out into the human condition. And the novel presents this wide array of characters who are driven by different motivations from being idealistic, passionate lo- labor organizers to people who are desperate and impoverished and just trying to make it through to the next day. I know when you were talking about things like your historical fiction shows or Game of Thrones, you always love the palace intrigue and the the talking behind the scenes and the manipulating. I often didn't love it in those, but I really liked it in this. And it's doing a very similar thing. But rather than people scheming about how they're going to be queen, it's the interworkings of these very ordinary people who are trying to organize a strike on an apple orchard. Oh. But it's all this talking behind the scenes, and it's just this one strike. That's kind of what the whole novel's about. But there's he manages to make it just very interesting through all of these different characters. Mm. Then he did Of Mice and Men in 1937. You know what? It's so famous. I don't have much to add. <laughs> it's uh, worth reading. Overall, the social commentary and what it says about innocence and how people are corrupted. It's all very heartbreaking and very well done. So go read that if you didn't have to in high school already. <laughs> he did The Grapes of Wrath regarded as one of the greatest novels of all time by many again super famous it doesn't need me to talk about it it won the pulitzer it won the national book award i don't think it's his best book but i do think it does the best job of capturing all of the themes of that kind of first half of his career all in one place so if you want one steinbeck novel that gets you all of that americana all the social commentary but also this epic scope that's probably a good one to go with But I think I liked East of Eden, his epic, and I mean epic, just (laughs) giant, giant book from 1952 even more. I think one of the things I liked about it best was because it's so long, it takes the first half of the novel, which is kind of the length of two regular novels, just to set things up. And not that it's setting up characters or even events that are just going to pay off in the later second half. Although it kind of does that as well. It sets up a way of thinking. It sets you into this world and a world that's essentially the one that we can still recognize today. And it doesn't really challenge much of your way at thinking in the first half, in the giant first half. But it does just a little bit and it makes you kind of exist in this world and kind of accept all of these things as, yes, this is the world. I've been in it for so long. Nothing here seems strange to me. And then when things start to change, when progress is being made in the second half of the book, or even if it's just something as similar as the same themes being treated differently, we go through this new generation because it takes place over generations. We go through that generation's growth and the change of their way of thinking. And at first it's kind of jarring to you, but then you realize that you're like agreeing with things more in the second half. If you are, you know, a socially conscious person in our lifetime, you <laughs> should be agreeing with things at least. Yes. And you question then, like, why did you go along with those things in the first half? And it presents you with similar sides of similar ideas, and it presents them all as equally valid. 
And then you just kind of have to sit in all of this thinking and question your own morality and your own way of thinking. And it may be presenting similar things slightly differently. And uh, you know, I, I think I'm just getting so <laughs> cerebral that it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay. But at the end, you just kind of question the very nature of good and evil and which one you are. I know I'm talking so abstractly, but it's hard to talk about a novel like that without talking about it for six hours. Right. So it's just, it's just so well crafted. It's incredibly long, but it's not like there's any filler. He often writes these novellas that are very short, but here he's doing the same thing, but each novella is a chapter. And just like how some novels would make great movies, this would be a eight season TV show. Oh. And you'd be like, yeah, that is a full arc that brings you all the way around, but it needs that much time. Right. And it needs to be set at that certain epic length because it just kind of wraps everything up and comments on what it's been doing over generations so wonderfully. I thought it was amazing. Huh. Well, I think I'd watch an eight season arc of it. <laughs> I don't know that if you'd love it. Maybe you would. <laughs> There's a lot of like biblical allegory and mm. stuff too, but it's it's just so good. I think I might just stop there because I could talk about them all. I did like every single novel of his that mm. I read, even some of his nonfiction. I think Travels with Charlie was my favorite, and that's just him getting in this kind of big camper truck thing he made with his poodle Charlie and traveling across America and just oh. his observations about America because... At a certain point in his career, he's like, I write about America, but when was the last time I saw every state? So uh -huh. he goes and does that. That was a good nonfiction one, but all of his fiction was so, so good. Uh, there's one thing I'd love to read of his, but they will not release it. When he was quite young in 1930, he wrote a mystery werewolf novel. Oh. And it got rejected and was never published. And they have it, but they won't publish it because they said, well, he never published it, so he must not have wanted to. And I just want to read his werewolf book so much. Yeah, that sounds interesting. I love Steinbeck. I love werewolves. I think it'd be great. Okay. I hope it's like a socialist werewolf. Socialist werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, go read all 30 some books of John Steinbeck's. Come on. What, do you, what else are you doing? Yeah, what else do you do with your time yeah you could watch three seasons of emily in paris and read 30 books by john steinbeck it sounds like some of them you might need the emily in paris to like bring you back up no you just want to live in this world oh, okay it's not inherently depressing he talks a lot about inequality but i think he's largely optimistic he is kind of going through things and thinking like, yeah, but we are the generation that's going to change it. Right. It seems that way. There's some are very depressing, sure. But I think overall, if you could describe it that way, I would say that he is optimistic about a lot of things. Hmm. And it's just sad now because we realize that, no, those things didn't change. <laughs> so that's kind of a bummer, but that he didn't mean it to be. So go read them all. Go to <laughs> the library. Why not? Pick them all up. All right. Well, are we ready to hear about what we're watching next? And do we get to know what the theme is? We do. Are you ready? I guess. <laughs> like, what, what do I have to really do to get ready? True. I just sit here and listen at this point. True. Um, so because it's summer, because it's either about to be August or is August, I decided that we were going to go with another kind of summery theme and go with a aquatic theme. Oh, so many good options. So my, many good options. I'm already thinking of what my pick could be. Um, it felt like without extending, because I did consider just extending the summer theme for another like two weeks. Well, you could argue that my pick last week also fits aquatic theme. Very aquatic. All that yeah. murder on the water. Exactly. So I thought aquatic was a good way to kind of round out the summer. Um, and we are going to do something a little bit different this week and do a We Love This You Should Too episode. Oh, so you know I love what your pick is. I do. Okay, well now I'm excited. Um, so you may want to go get your boat and your chicken 
Oh shit! And I know what it Huck, is. Yep. And we're gonna watch the 2016 animated film Moana. I am Moana. Moana. So I feel like this is one where we don't really need to like give a preamble. This is one that we enjoy. It evokes feelings of being on vacation in a hot place. And so I thought it was a good thing to bring forward in the summer. Absolutely. I'm in for it. <laughs> um, do you want to give a pitch? Because we kind of assume that most of our North American listeners are familiar with Moana, but maybe not everyone is. So Moana is about an adventurous teenager who sets sail on a daring mission to save her people. During her journey, Moana meets the once mighty demigod Maui, who guides her on her quest to become a master wayfinder. Together, they sail across the open ocean in an action-packed voyage, encountering enormous monsters and finding out what's important to them. And uh, if you're not familiar, this is a Disney animated film. Yes, it is. So it is available on Disney+. Plus. Um, it was written, all of the music was written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, and it has a completely singable soundtrack from start to finish yes it does a little background information samantha wants to listen to disney soundtracks all the time all the time i do like d music <laughs> i like the disney music maybe with all of my picks about uh you know german expressionism and steinbeck you might think like oh indy doesn't like disney stuff i do i love it <laughs> i know all the words to moana but i can't listen to it every day no it would drive me crazy. That, that's too much for me. And he so, gets songs stuck in his head really easily. And uh, severely? Yes. I'll, it'll be in there for weeks. To the point of madness. Yeah, <laughs> I will go mad. That's absolutely true. So I made a stipulation that we can listen to Disney soundtracks on vacations. Yes. So road trips, even if it's just going uh, on a two-hour drive to the next city over, the next town over. Like next we're a small town over. Town. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I will go with the Disney soundtracks. And Moana is definitely one of my higher ranked ones. I think it may even be like top three for me now. Yeah, it it's is. I think it's like three or four for just straight soundtracks. Yeah. I love it. It's a party in a soundtrack. It immediately makes you happy. Um, I think... This soundtrack definitely reminds me of all-inclusive resorts because we would often listen to it when we were like showering and getting changed for dinner and that was like prime Moana time. So join us next week when we discuss the Disney film Moana. And you too can be Moana. I am Moana! Moana. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.